All right, hello, this is Dimitri, um, and this is going to be a blog that is entitled Science, Scientism, and Pseudoscience. And this is going to be my attempt to speak somewhat seriously about these three things, how they're different, where they overlap, and to kind of cement some personal conclusions about what they mean. Now, let me begin with an anecdote, as I always do. Basically, I was hanging out with some people, and we were talking about something in the midst of, of a discussion, and I was really trying to stimulate intellectual discussion about the whole notion of human greed, and why we have the kind of economic system that we have, which is illogical. I was thinking a lot about wastefulness, and human potential, and things like that. I might have very probably been channeling some uh, unconscious recollections of having watched Zeitgeist Addendum, years ago, but I didn't realize that that was probably what I was doing. Um, and I was just trying to stimulate discussion according to you know, my philosophical convictions about the responsibility of an individual to create discussion in this group of people, some of whom are my frequent friends, others of whom I had not seen since high school, and others of whom were mutual friends I'd never met. And they were more or less out to have a good time, but I hadn't seen some of these people in a long time, and they were being educated and we were discussing things and I decided, mm, let's actually engage in a discussion. I was met with a lot of dogmatism and this thing must have happened months ago. I know it happened months ago, uh, maybe about half a year ago, and it still is one of those events when I'm still figuring out what the hell went wrong in this kind of conversation. Why did it not go so much better? And realizing that it wasn't my fault. That these things tend to be simply because I think the things that frustrate me the most are the things that I'm not necessarily most responsible for. But let's, uh, I'm just, I'm not using this as means for bragging. I assure you, on the contrary, I've made it a point to be as quote-unquote objective as possible, and I'm, I'm oftentimes frustrated with people not so much because of their potentialities or their personalities, but because of this culture, I think it's a result of this culture, who really don't seem to know what they're talking about, and who say, well, who are you to have the temerity and audacity to, 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 to appear like you know better? But really, that's what every one of us has to do, and, and really, we, I think, have to be our own worst critics. Now, what we're talking about is this notion of the three-level brain, and Mind you, when I first encountered this idea, um, it was a challenge to my existing views. I had for a while struggled with this whole notion of this duality, seemingly of order and chaos. You know, there's a civilized human being who wants things to make sense rationally, who's almost angelic in his or her capacity for reason, for uh, seeing through class distinctions, through relating with other people. But then there's this more primitive aspect of us, which is very interesting, which is which is hard to eliminate, has to be reconciled with this irrational aspect, this Dionysiac aspect, which just kind of manifests things out of, out of the ether, so to speak, which is very emotive, which, is, which can be very constructive and needs to be acknowledged because we always have it in us, we'll always have these feelings, these like shadow projections and other projections, and we just have to acknowledge them and figure out how they work. Well, I had a friend who was largely self-taught. In fact, frankly, he was a hitchhiker. Um, he was a traveler, but he did a good deal of reading. And this is one of the few people that I could actually talk to for hours on length, at length and, uh, and not feel um, put down in any way. So when we did disagree, it, was, it really shook me a lot because I, I didn't want to disagree with him because he seemed so knowledgeable. And I'll admit, with him, pretty much most of the times that we disagreed, either... Um, you know, either he was right, 
or or was um well i i think that d- depending on what we were discussing sometimes i'd say there's an argument that i was right but he has a he's perfectly entitled to his uh, to to his w- way of seeing things too to be pretty subjective but um but I, but usually either he was right or we were just arguing semantics what he said basically was that um I, you know what i'd held as my idea at the time was that there's the uh, there's the neo pallium the ordered principle the 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 self responsible individual and then there's the the hindbrain and i learned this from the work of Aldous Huxley, because usually I reject popular culture right now and I go to the classics. The problem with doing that with scientific research is that usually you'll get something which may be a bit outdated. And, um, you know, uh, that's fine because there is a lot of dogmatism in, uh, in our cu- cu- culture too. Um, and I wouldn't, for the, in the least exempt the scientific community from being vulnerable to that dogmatism because we're all human and a company is a company, let's be frank. There's going to be corruption in it. In fact, my parents are researchers. They, my mother had a boss who was very bureaucratic and uh, I, I know from anecdotal evidence in these respects uh, that, uh, that, that really there's a lot of, and anecdotal evidence is very important. In fact, I'm going to make the case that it's the most kind of important evidence. Um, I've noticed that there's a, there's definitely the potential for corruption in the scientific community as there is in any community, any enterprise you can think of, so we always have to be very vigilant. So I was hanging out with these people, and basically what they said was that... Um, well, I said that, th- that this was what I heard, that it was actually a three-level brain, not a, not the hind brain and the evolved brain. And, um, and this girl said, well, you know, that's just what you heard. And she was drunk at the time, mind you. I had never met her before. But that's not a fact, you know? And then my friend is this... <laughs> he, 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 who I was hanging out with, he said, basically... Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, although he'd made the same argument. Um, th- he made the argument in the past uh, against my convictions that true objectivity from a scientific perspective can't exist. It's like Jacques Fresco said um, that in, this is an industrial engineer, a man of science, saying that the human beings cannot be objective. And pretty much every philosophical school and all serious consideration of research would suggest is that objectivity doesn't really exist. So I was baffled by what she meant, and then baffled by what my friend said. But then it just took me months to realize this, that this is a, a fine example of this point of the three-level brain. And for those of you who don't know what the idea is, um, basically the notion is the recently evolved brain is responsible for reasoning capacity, um, maybe things like empathy, the ability to relate with people outside of your cultural group. Um, the midbrain is responsible for a status in a pack. What you want to do is take what we call the energy, well, the, the impulses from that, and couple it with the higher brain in order to be able to transcend the social tribal group and actually relate with more people. Incidentally, my friend, who is a, a pronounced introvert, um, who's read a good deal on things like introversion, said that probably extroversion would have much, much more to do with the midbrain than the evolved brain, but that does sound a bit eugenic, I'll admit. But that's just what he said. So, um, don't knock me for that. Um, I'm just putting that out there as an idea. And, of course, the hindbrain is concerned with survival. So... I entertained this possibility and saw it really worked for me. Like, if I made this distinction, I could really strive to be the best person I could be. And if I felt some creeping emotional response, then, you know, that's the other parts of the brain working. But what my friend sitting next to me at this point said is that this, this theory is very dubious. But he never provided for me another theory. He just expected me, expected me to accept it. 
And here's where we come to an important philosophical distinction, where I'm going to be a bit pedantic, so I'm going to pardon me. I'm just trying to spread these ideas. There's rational empiricism, there's radical empiricism. What my friend was inviting me to do is basically to adopt the attitude of rational empiricism, that is, rationally speaking, the group, the intersubjective community, can agree that this is dubious, we shouldn't believe in it. Radical empiricism says, look, forget what the group is saying. If what you've heard matches up with your own personal experience, much like in the doctrine of Buddhism, really, and many forms of uh, spiritual emancipation, forms of shamanism, things like that, um, if it matches up with your experience, and if it works, um, which is a pragmatism, which is based in the work of William James, um, then you should adopt it, basically. So, this, um, this whole consideration became very muddled and very frustrating. But, you know, I can see in the context now, presuming that, you know, I held my point of view, my theory, that what we're working with here is not really rational discourse, but it's actually midbrain activity in this very conversation. Because, basically, midbrain is concerned with status in the pack. Now, why should I lend a group of people who essentially haven't given me any, uh, any alternative model to work with, but who basically need, just negated a model, any more authority than someone whom I've met, who, while may have, he may have not been college educated, may have developed, a, uh, developed along a, a unique uh, tradition of scholarship, you know. I mean, all my favorite musicians are self-taught, all my favorite filmmakers are self-taught. I, I deeply respect this, and I, I've always been painfully aware of this duality between systematic education, my own personal interest in things, it, the more the time I've spent looking at my own dreams, I see that the imagination is a sprawling thing for me, which which makes connections, which, um, whether this is a big problem for me in school, but, but, but it shouldn't be a problem, it's only a problem from the, the perspective of our society, which uh, the, the imagination stays with things, and, and, and it, it keeps thinking about things, you know, they, they keep recurring, things you've haven't heard about in years, crop up again, and relate back really fast if you pay attention to them. But our school system tells us, you know, you learn this over here and you learn that over there, which is totally, like, totally unrelated, um, and maybe contradictory. It, it doesn't offer you any way of resolving these contradictions, not only between what, what uh, say, the educational system teaches and what, you know, Stephen Hawking actually says, because... For one reason or another, we learn an outdated model of the atom. But also, like within the school system itself, you teach, you learn biology, and you learn about human beings this way. But then you learn psychology and literature, and you learn about human beings in a radically different way. How do you reconcile these two different ways of looking at things? How do you make decisions? This is what true education is, and I can and I hold this view with a lot of people who have rejected book learning, basically. And I've also talked to professors who pointed out that they criticized the school system. In fact, one who posts videos to, um, to YouTube, Gregory Sadler, a philosophy professor, um, said something which would probably be relevant to most people in any discipline, and he said, look, um, most of what he learned, he learned after he got his PhD, but this is a PhD talking and saying, look, in his field, you wouldn't really need a PhD to study this stuff. Now, people like Jacques Fresco, I don't know if they have PhDs, they're, they're self-taught. Um, why, and, and, you know, the more I listen to people, like, in the educated community, I just hear the same stuff over and over and over again, nothing, nothing new, disregard for third parties or political politics are concerned, uh, just, you know, our, our NPR just kind of asks, well, how are things going to people who are stationed in Afghanistan, don't really seem to make any pressing questions or anything like that. So, you know, there's this whole kind of, uh, this whole kind of, I think, hypocrisy in, um, in the educational system. Uh, and, you, you know, I'll, I'll go so far as to say it's a bullshit hypocrisy. 
Um, and I think uh, it's very con contrary to what education is supposed to teach us in the humanities. Because if you really look at the people that we're taught to admire, like Einstein and Thoreau and other people, they're very individualistic in how they approach things, you know. Um, not in the sense that they're self-serving, but in the sense that they're self-evaluating. So this woman, she said, you know, I went to school, and my, my, mind you, she was drunk at the time, they all tend to inhabit, uh, inhibit, I think, um, the main brain, uh, the, the, the rational brain. She said, you know, I went to school for this stuff, and, uh, and I, I have the facts, you just have opinions. Like, what is this? You know, what is this one-upmanship? What the hell is this? And uh, what I realized is, um, you know, basically, I could lend her this authority up completely arbitrarily and say she she's right. Now she has a fact. And I could say, well, I have a fact because I agree with her. And then, you know, where does her fact come from? Well, she lends authority to these college people who may have been educated, but may have been educated in a very systematic way. And as soon as they gained prestige, they stopped really thinking outside the box. In fact, since people started listening to them, they probably started repeating themselves a lot, became specialists in early thinkers. Um, this is a Shostovian reasoning. If you want to look up the work of Lev Shestov, you know, he's an interesting, very brilliant philosopher who points out how this works. Anyway, um, what I've arrived at, you know, the, here I'm going to make a little departure into pretty imaginative territory. You know, I hear people say things like pseudoscience. So here, you know, the, like I said, I was going to title this Scientism, Science, and Pseudoscience. What is Scientism? Scientism is the, this whole notion that science gives us facts. But sci the scientific point of view is that everything's falsifiable. There can be no facts. Um, so what are we dealing with here? Well, we're dealing here with this kind of tribal mindset, this, this notion, well, I'm going to lend you authority because you seem informed, so tribal thinking, midbrain thinking, um, even if it disagrees with my anecdotal evidence. And one of the key giveaways of that night was that my friend told me, you know, you can't go by, about these things by anecdotal evidence, and that's like, comes back to radical empiricism and rational empiricism. Um, which I'll define a bit more clearly a bit soon. But first of all, let me bring up another anecdote. I was much earlier. I was hanging out with these people, who were fairly pretentious, and um, and they said. Well, one of them said, uh, you know, well, I I said it in an exa example in this stupid ideological argument, which began with actually a, a, an innocent set of questions, but they cited all this dogma, and I said, you know. Well, what about aboriginals who can, like, sense groundwater for miles underground? They said, this is pseudoscience. This is pseudoscience. That can't happen. Why not? And this is one of the reasons I'm interested in the work of Rupert Sheldrake, because he points out the philosophical presuppositions which rule out these kind of possibilities against overwhelming anecdotal evidence um, that things like psychic connection exist. There's just not research for it. So there's radically, there's radical empirical evidence for this in personal experience. That's what radical empiricism is based on. But there's not rational empiricism. There's not a fixed common view about these things. But then these are the kind of people, I'd, I'd imagine, who would at the same time say, well, we know what part of the brain is responsible for what. And, and not just we think, we know. And I think there's something entirely counterintuitive and counterlogical to this. Because... Um, well, just, just at this point in the discussion, I could just imagine if I tried to present this at a, at a table discussion with some young people and just hearing some of my friends, how they'd interrupt and just distract the whole thing, derail it. Anyway, sorry. Um, you know, basically, um, and now where was I? It's counterintuitive and counterlogical to think that simply because you know, it, to think that we cannot know scientifically that some aboriginals can sense groundwater miles underground 
but we can know the function of our brain. Because if you think about it, first of all, structural functionalism is an aesthetic movement. That's all that it really is. It's an aesthetic movement. And um, we anthrop anthropomorphizing our own nature when we speak in terms of function, which is ironic because anthropomorphizing means to attribute the qualities of humanity to, but it's to attribute cultural views of what it means to be a human being to, to in this case, a human being. Um, we're making a big error, you see. Because here's the thing. I, as a subjective person, can know what it means to be reasonable, can know what it means to be rational, can understand my passions, can understand my dim inklings, can understand my fears. That's me as a subject. When I begin to view myself as an object, that disappears. You see. Now someone else might view my brain objectively, so to speak, in an experiment. That person's still a subject. Right? So it's like the saying, what is nearest to you is actually farthest away, or hardest to understand. Now, how do I communicate with that person what I experience subjectively, and how does that person equate uh, those words I said with a mental concept in his or her own mind, which somehow he or she presumes to be the same as mine, and then claim a, cor a direct correlation between something like greed or love or something, and, and end up identify a part of the brain as part of that. Well, it's completely counter-logical. <laughs> you see, it's completely counterintuitive. So, you know, we can't get out of that. And this is the criticism that William James made. Um, and William James was one of the most scientific philosophers that we've had. But people instinctively, you might say, from the back of their brains, the back of their minds, don't want to believe that we don't know. So, what, b but like with something like, you know, the, 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 the aboriginals sensing groundwater underground, you know, I mean, you could at least imagine an instance where you could feasibly see this, and even if you'd have no rational explanation to prove it, you know, I mean, it would be really a matter of how much um, effort you're willing to put in. Um, to reevaluate yourself and your cultural norms. Rupert Sheldrake is brilliant, not just as a researcher, but as a philosopher. Um, well, why should I accept what my friend, or the same friend I was mentioning, you know, said about how there's no such thing as morphic resonance or whatever, because there's overwhelming evidence against it. Now, hold on, how can there be evidence against it if there's evidence for it? Is it you can prove the existence of something. You can't really prove the non-existence of something. You can only prove that it would seem illogical given our current frame of reference. It's simply because you have no experience with it. Empirical evidence does not rule out its possibility. If you have empirical evidence, you can't really disprove it. You can only give us a theory. These are things which don't occur to a number of people, apparently. Apparently, I don't know. Maybe it's just my friend who's, mm, I don't know, maybe not as intelligent as he seems, I don't know. Um, or if you'd like to. My point is that th these things don't stand up to the test of logic. So what we have to do is we, we should abandon, I think, the rational view of empiricism, which is hearing what you, which is just going by what you've heard, and really always balance out, realize that everything that you know is really what you've heard or read, conceptually. Uh, always, we don't rule that out, we don't rule out education, but you always have to balance that out with immediate experience, radical empiricism. And I think that that's truly being scientific. So for me, the most scientific thing I can think of for the brain is the three-level model, because that's the one that's answered the most questions, helped me the most. It was challenging to accept at first. Seems the most up-to-date. I got it from a, a source I deeply respect. It seems to have worked for him. And, you know, the whole essence of pragmatism is, you know, we can never arrive at the absolute truth through science, but we have to arrive at what works. And this extends to other things like... Um, these supposedly scientific dogmas about, you know, what is, uh, you know, women being worse drivers than men. Worse is a subjective quality, or human beings being intrinsically greedy. Greed is a learned behavior. There's no definite greed. We define that person as being greedy if we don't think that, if we don't take into consideration that person's needs. It's cultural. A lot of these things, which are supposedly scientific truths, would not exist if we didn't have 
a culture which would allow us to conceptualize of them in this way. The most radical thing I can imagine is to say, look, science has to be, in its conclusions, just as politically correct as art. It's not this metaphysical god that you could pray to who's always right. This is a, it's not a parental figure. This is, um, this is a human activity, and every one of us individually is responsible for deciding for him or herself what maps of reality most match up with one's own experience. So that's all I had to say. Thank you for listening to this. Hopefully this will have been one of the more rational and informed and sincere, and sincere well, all of my blogs are sincere, of my blogs up until this time. Thank you.